Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm a grateful member of Al-Anon, and my name is Angie. Angie. My home group is a Happy Destiny Al-Anon family group in Destin, Florida. I bring you greetings from my group, and would like to welcome you anytime you're down our way to come to our meeting. We meet at the United Methodist Church Tuesdays at 11 o'clock. We go out for lunch afterwards, and and we believe in having a good time and having fun in recovery. So anytime you're our way, please come join us. I'd like to thank Baron. I'd like to thank the committee. I'd like to thank all those responsible for this weekend. We, we're having a wonderful time here. Uh, it's beautiful, and I'm, I'm overwhelmed with all the people in this room that I love so well that are here. Oh, I'm just a little bit overwhelmed by that. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. I heard somebody say one time that Al-Anon is all about relationships, and I would agree that it's all about relationships. By the way, do we have any alcoholics that are here today? <laughs> Woo-hoo! I love y'all. I love y'all. I love you. I love you. But I would also say that al is a lot about hope and it's a lot about miracles. And I hope you'll hear some of those in the, in the story that I share today. I was raised in a military family. My dad was an Army officer, and so that meant, of course, that we were always moving, thinking about moving, getting ready to move, wondering where we were going to move, packing, unpacking. That was life for us. My father was not an alcoholic. He truly was a social drinker. <clears throat> and what that meant for me was a few times growing up, my dad would come in from a military function, and he would be a little bit tipsy. And so he would go over to the phone, and he would get out of his address book, and he would call all of his old military buddies. And he would sit there on the phone and reminisce and tell military stories with his buddies. And I love that time because my dad talked very little about his military experiences. I do know that um, when we were in Germany, he was responsible for the Honest John missiles, which were some of the first missiles the military had that had nuclear warheads on them. But he didn't talk much about any of those things. So I loved it when he would be on the phone talking to his old army buddies. So for me, that little tipsy was a lot of fun. My mother was an alcoholic, and she was quite physically abusive to me growing up. So she and I had a pretty tumultuous relationship with each other for a lot of years. I have a brother seven years older than I am named Glenn. And Glenn is a genius in math and science. He truly is. And he excelled at any sport that involved a ball. He was the quarterback on the football team, the forward on the basketball team, the pitcher on the baseball team, whatever you are with the golf league, whatever you are with the with the bowling league. I mean, he was it. If it had a ball in it, he was wonderful at it. And, you know, we'd move to a new place, and my brother would just fit right in. And, you know, there was a quarterback there before we got there. There was a pitcher there before we got there. There was a forward on the basketball team there before we got there. But Glenn would just dive right in, and that's why he would be, and everybody loved him. And then there was me, and I lived my life in books. I love to read. I believe I've read every day of my life since I learned the alphabet, and I love it. Because, you see, I learned pretty quickly as a military brat that if I said hello to you, that meant I was going to have to say goodbye to you. And I did not like saying goodbye. So it wasn't too long before I learned to hardly ever say hello. But I could fall in love with the people in those books. I could go to places that I could only imagine. I could fall in love with those men, women, children, everybody. And I never had to tell them goodbye. They went with me wherever I went. And that was my family. And we looked really good on the outside. If you saw us, you would say, oh, look at the Rayleigh family. Aren't they something? da 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 you know. But on the inside, we were really four individual islands that lived under one roof. We would come together for dinner every evening because that was very important to my mother. And then we would just live on our individual islands. And we would kind of do our thing, and we'd come together when we had to, but we just lived on those islands. And that's how I grew up. Of course, there came a time that the opposite sex became quite attractive to me. And this is what he was like at that time. He was tall, dark hair. He walked into a room and people would say, oh look, oh look, he's here, he's here. Everybody would be so happy to see him. He could tell a story. He could make you believe just about anything with the stories that he would tell. 
He knew how to date a woman. He knew how to, the, the right things to say when he was dating her. He also, in my experience, had been either sexually and or physically and or emotionally abused growing up. He sexually and or physically and or emotionally abused the women that he was involved with. He uh, didn't know much about feelings. He knew how to express anger in inappropriate ways, and he did. Uh, didn't know a thing about conflict or how to resolve it. And couldn't communicate about things that he really felt deeply. And it was many years before I realized that he was me. He was me. Because, you see, that's who I was, too. The only thing different in the he and in the me was that he drank alcohol and I didn't. That was the only difference in the two of us, really. I understand selfishness, self-centeredness, fear, resentment, anger. I understand those things. In addition, I would lie when it would be just as easy to tell the truth. Sometimes I would lie and I would think, Angie, why did you lie about that? There was absolutely no reason to lie, and I would just lie. I could castrate or crucify you with the words that would come out of my mouth. I could talk you into a corner, and I could hold you in that corner with my words until the only way you could get out of that corner would be to push or shove your way out. And boy, did I know how to make you feel guilty about that. I believed if you'd let me control the world and everybody in it, we would all be so much better off. I could manipulate with the best of them. I didn't really like normal a whole lot. That was kind of boring to me. So if things were normal for very long, I would get bored. So I would create some chaos. And I was so good at it, at the end of it, you would be apologizing to me for that chaos. (laughs) When I was the one that had started it. I'm not proud that that's who I am. And you heard me say that's who I am. Because that is who I am. That is part of who I am. But I am proud and grateful that we have a transformative program called Al-Anon that allows me to stand before you today as a woman of dignity and grace. In most days, I can choose to be that woman of dignity and grace. Sometimes I hear people say, uh, so-and-so is my qualifier for Al-Anon. Well, I will tell you, there are many alcoholics that satisfy the membership requirement for me for Al-Anon. Al-Anon says that we have to know somebody that has a problem with alcohol to be a member of Al-Anon. But I am my own qualifier. I have a set of symptoms and behaviors that I exhibit when I am not in the midst of recovery. And sometimes I exhibit them even when I am. And then I've got to inventory. I've got to make amends. I've got to do those things that I know I need to do to get back on the right track. If I choose to continue in this path of recovery and be of service to God and my fellows. So, His wounded heart would call out to my tortured soul, and we would join hands together, and we would walk off into the sunset to live happily ever after. And I will tell you from me, it just never worked. It just didn't. Short-term relationships, short-term marriages. I am a runner, so it didn't take long, and I'd be out of there. It just didn't work. And that was my life. In 1978, I lived in a small town in South Alabama called Andalusia. I know you can't tell I've ever lived in the South. And I went to my first Al-Anon meeting. It was in a church in another small South Alabama town called Alp. And when we got there and walked in, this lady was standing in the doorway, and she held out her hand to me. And she said, honey, you come with me. And her name was Miss Ina, and I can see her today as well as I saw her that night in 1978. It was 1978, so she had this tall, bouffant hairdo with curls everywhere. They were brown. She had glasses on a chain around her neck. She was wearing a royal blue silk dress that belted around her waist. Uh, She had on pantyhose, some kind of hose. She had black patent leather high heel shoes on. She had her jewelry on. She had a big smile. And that was my first album on me. You know, some of you might want to know that there may be somebody here this weekend that's going to be describing you many, many years from now. And what you are wearing today. When you welcome them here to this conference. I can't tell you one thing that was said that night. You know, sometimes great events happen in our lives and we don't remember because we didn't know they were great events. But I can tell you, she gave me a one day at a time book that night that I still have today. And I knew I was home. I knew I was home. On the way home that night, the friend that had taken me to the meeting said, well, how'd you like the meeting? I said, oh, I loved it. But I don't think I can go back. And he said, why? And I said, well, I don't know any alcoholics. Now, please understand, by this time, I had been married to several. (laughs) All my great 
right uncles were alcoholic. My favorite uncles were alcoholic. My favorite aunt was alcoholic. My mother was an alcoholic. But you see, to me, they were my uncles. It was Uncle Vernon. It was Aunt Mud. It was my mother. I didn't associate at that time the behaviors they had with the disease of alcoholism. I just knew that every so often my dad had to go get my uncle's tractor out of the ditch because he had driven it, was trying to drive it to the office, which he called the bar. And my dad would have to go dig him in. I didn't think anything about that, except I thought he was a poor driver of his tractor at night. That's all I thought. I never associated the two. So I was in and out of Al-Anon. And let me say this, too. In South Alabama in 1978, Al-Anon was made up of women who were married to the men that went to the AA meeting that met at the same time in a room at, at that same church. And that's not who I was. So while I really identified with the message, I didn't really identify with the messengers. I'm so grateful today that Al-Anon is made up of all kinds of us from all walks of life. So I was in and out of Al-Anon for about 12 years. I would stay a while and then I'd run out there and marry somebody else and then they'd mess up and I'd run back, you know, and woe is me and they'd always welcome me and I'd learn a little bit more to be dangerous and I'd run back out there again. Finally, June 15th, 1990, I said, Angie, you are so blessed. You have found Al-Anon. You know, most people never find us. Even today, most people never find us. Lois Wilson, the co-founder of Al-Anon, Bill Wilson's wife, was quite concerned about that. She even wrote about that. She said, we are not a secret society. We are not a secret society. People will read about us getting alcohol-related car accidents, getting arrested for drinking, but how are they going to get the good news of recovery? How are they going to get that? I worry about that, too. How are they going to get that? Well, I had gotten it. And number two, I could choose to stay. Most people that come to Al-Anon don't choose to stay. We see them once or twice, maybe three times, and then we don't see them anymore. Now, I hope seeds are planted and that sometime in the future they come back. That's always my hope. But I know for some of those people, they come looking for that magic pill to save the life of their loved one, and I understand that. And they find out we don't have the magic pill to save the life of their loved one. We only have a magic pill to save them. And many are like me who didn't feel worthy enough, and so they don't come back. Well, I had been in and out enough that I could choose to stay. So June 15th, 1990, I chose to stay. And since that time, I've been a very active and continuing member of the Worldwide Fellowship of al and Alateen. And it has changed everything in my life. Everything in my life has changed because of that program and because of Open AA. Because, you see, when I got to Al-Anon, my sponsor said, Angie, you have the family disease of alcoholism. You have a mental obsession. You have it. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? She said, it behooves you to learn everything you can about alcoholism. So we got in the car and we went. Us Al-Anons, we usually have one convention a year. My state doesn't even have one convention a year, but we usually do. And we'll have one district workshop and a district picnic. And that's what we have in Al-Anon. But AA folks are doing stuff all the time. And almost all of it is with Al-Anon participation. And you welcome us. And I'm so grateful that you do. Because I went and I learned. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So thank you, Alcoholics Anonymous, for allowing us to do that. Thank you. Thank you. So that was my journey. The beginnings of my journey. May 18th, 1991, I woke up and I said, I'm going to see Amanda today. You see, the best thing that came out of my first marriage was my daughter, Amanda. And Amanda had grown up, and she was a college student in North Alabama <clears throat> at a prominent university. <clears throat> so, uh, and, and I have two grandchildren, and I have two grandchildren that are college students at the other prominent university in Alabama. <laughs> That's interesting. But anyway, I said, I'm going to go see Amanda. You see, it'd been three months and I hadn't heard from her. And I've been back in Al-Anon now about a year, and I was really trying to live this this program. And so I was waiting on God to tell me what to do about Amanda, and I knew that morning it was time to go see her. So I called my two best friends, and we got in the car, and we trekked off to Tuscaloosa, Alabama to see Amanda. On the way, my friend Beretta said, what are we going to do when we get there? And I said, you know, Beretta, I don't know, but I know God's going to let us know what to do. And, and I will say that there are times in my life, if I'm doing the kind of recovery that I know I need to do, 
If I'm going to meetings, if I'm practicing my steps, if I'm sponsoring, if I'm being of service to God and my fellows, if I'm trying to be as spiritually fit as I can, sometimes God will just do for me what I can't do for myself. And that whole day was kind of that kind of day. We got to Tuscaloosa. We got to my daughter's apartment complex. And out front was a whole bank of mailboxes. You know, they're all lined up there. And there was mail scattered all over the ground underneath the mailboxes. So we walked over and we started picking it up. And all that mail had my daughter's name on it. So we gathered up the mail. We put it in the car. And we went to her door. Not. Nobody answered. I said, I'm going to go find the apartment manager and get him to come open up the door so that we can find out what's going on. So one friend and I walked away. We're walking downstairs. The other friend had stayed there by the apartment door, and Melody called out. And she said, Angie, Angie, she's here. And I turned around and went back up the stairs, and there was Amanda standing in the doorway. And I want to say here that anybody I talk about in my story has given the approval for me to do that. So I walked up to Amanda, and I hugged her. And I said, Amanda, I love you, and it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. We walked inside, sat down, talked for a few minutes, and then I said, Amanda, I want you to know that I'm here today to make you an offer. And you know, in my mind, I was thinking, mm, I wonder what the offer is going to be. <laughs> and then these words just started coming, and I said, I know something's wrong. I don't know what it is. I don't know what's happening, but I know there's something wrong, Amanda. And, I'm, and I thought, that's good. That's a good way to start. <laughs> and I said, I'm here today to make you an offer. If you accept my offer, I'm going to do exactly what I say I'm going to do. If you don't, that's okay, too. We'll spend the day together. We'll enjoy each other's company. I'm still going to be your mother. I'm still going to love you. And I'm going to go home, and I'll never make this offer again. And, of course, inside I'm saying, Angie, don't do this. Don't do this. So I said, Amanda, I'm willing to take you wherever I've got to take you, pay whatever I've got to pay, do whatever I've got to do to get you the help that you need. And I'm like, yay! And then I said, but the offer's only good for an hour. Well, you can imagine inside, I'm just screaming, don't do this. And I stood up, and I said, and I'm going to give you an hour to make up your mind. And I left. I cried for the whole hour because I knew Amanda wasn't going to accept that offer. Came back an hour later, walked in, talked for a few minutes, and she said, Mama, I accept your offer. And, you know, my mind was a total blank. It was just a total blank. And this name came to me of a therapist way down in South Alabama. So I got up and went to the phone, and I called Information. For those of you that don't know, we used to have a woman named Information. <laughs> and her number was 411. <laughs> and if you had given permission, you could call Information, and she would tell whoever called your phone number. So I called Information, gave her this therapist's name. Information gave me her number. I called her. She answered the phone on a Saturday morning. I told her who I was. That there, that there was a problem with my daughter. By this time, Amanda had told me she'd written a few bad checks. I said, she's written a few bad checks. The therapist said, what do you think's going on? I said, I have no idea. The therapist said, well, maybe she's got a mental illness. I said, maybe she does, because I knew a little bit about mental illness, and I thought, you know, if she has a mental illness, we can get her some good therapy, maybe get her some medication for a while, and she'll be okay. So we talked a little bit. The therapist said, I'll call you back. She did, and as a result of that, at 9 o'clock the next morning, I had Amanda admitted to Providence Hospital in Mobile, Alabama, way down southeast Alabama, southwest Alabama. And at that time, the hospital had a floor of their hospital. Half of the floor was for persons with drug and alcohol problems, and half of the floor was for persons with mental illness. And so Amanda was admitted to the half of the floor for persons with a mental illness. Because when I admitted her, her psychiatrist, Dr. Thomas, who has since gone on to that great meeting in the sky, Dr. Thomas said, what do you think's wrong with your daughter? And I said, I don't know. She's written a few bad checks. And Dr. Thomas said, well, maybe she has a mental illness. And I said, maybe she does too. So we admitted her to that part of the hospital. And I left her there. And Amanda stayed there two months. And every weekend, after the first two weeks, I would go see her. And every weekend, she would tell me serious and dramatic things that had happened in her life that I didn't know anything about. Very serious and dramatic things. But for me... The most serious and dramatic thing that she told me was the day that she told me that she was an alcoholic. Because, you see, I had been running from the disease of alcoholism and to the disease of alcoholism all of my life. And I knew I had a decision to make that day. Was I going to run from Amanda or was I going to run to her? When I got home that day, I fell on my knees, and I took step one in a way I had never taken it before. I knew my life was unmanageable. I could see the unmanageability all around me. 
but I did not want to admit I was powerless. I don't know what there was about that illusion of power that I just clung to so hard. But that day I gave it up. I gave it up. I went to the next al meeting. I asked Debbie if she'd be my sponsor, and we dove into the steps in a way I never had before. Step two was easy for me. I have always known that there is something greater than me in the universe. I've always known that, and I choose to call that God. So that was easy. But you see, I tried to live my life kind of under the radar of God, just kind of skimming along there right out of his view, because I believed if he ever really saw me, if he ever truly saw me, he would not want someone like me that had done the things that I had done to be on this beautiful earth that he had created. So I just tried to hide from him. So as you can imagine, when I got to step three, that was a little bit harder. Because step three says, I'm to turn my will and my life over to the care of this God that I've been trying to hide from. But I figured out a way to do that. I said, I'm going to do that one day. I will do that one day. I am so grateful for my Alan on lineage, and I'm so grateful for the way that I worked the steps that first time. You see, I worked the steps the way my sponsor had worked the steps with her sponsor. So we had this workbook, this uh, study guide, and all this stuff to read, a lot of reading to do, and 12 questions for each step. And and also, my, my Al-Anon lineage, a strong arm of it goes like this. It goes from Lois Wilson to Arbutus in Texas, from Arbutus in Texas to a couple more ladies, and from those ladies to Lou Bell in Little Rock, Arkansas, who was Charlie's wife, and from Lou Bell to Mary Pearl, in North Little Rock, Arkansas, and from Mary Pearl to Debbie, Debbie to me. And when Arbutus was carrying the good news of al across Texas, all she had was the big book of Alcott's Anonymous in the 12 and 12. Thank you, Alcott's Anonymous, for allowing us and some 300, I've been told, other anonymous groups to use that literature. Thank you. <laughs> so in my al lineage, we have always used those books. Now, as the al literature has been printed and developed and published, we've used every book, every pamphlet. I've got all the al stuff, and I love it. But we also use the AAB book in 12 and 12. So, so I met with Debbie at the clubhouse, and I did step three with her, and I answered those 12 questions. And I never told Debbie I was sticking on to the end of step three one day. I never told her. So when we finished, she said, okay, Angie, when you get up in the morning, you're going to say the third step prayer. You'll say it every day for the rest of your life. And when we got to seven, she added that on as well. So the next morning when I got up, I had to say the third step prayer. And as you know, it starts off. God, I offer myself to thee. And it wasn't one day. It was right now. Right now. And I knew God was seeing me. For a while when I said that prayer, I would just sob. Because I knew he was, he was going to kill me. I really believe that. That's why I'm really careful when I sponsor women today and some men. Because I would have done whatever Debbie asked me to do. There came a time I stopped crying. Then there came a time I started singing. And now, although I still do get misty-eyed sometimes. But now a lot of times today I sing the third and seventh step prayer. And at the end of it I say, God, what mission have you got for us today? Let's get on with it. When we finished step three, Debbie handed me a packet. 30 pages, front and back, single spaced. Nothing but question after question after question after question about my life. Childhood, middle school, everything you can, everything you can imagine. She said, this is your four step inventory. Well, I used to meet with Debbie right before the meeting. So I went over there to my spot and sat down. And the meeting got started and I'm going through those pages. And I am bargaining with God. Because you see, there's something I know I don't have to tell. I'm sure none of you have anything that you don't want to tell, but I had something. And I knew I didn't have to tell it. I had always rationalized and justified why I didn't have to tell it. So I'm going through there and I'm talking to God, hard as I can talk to him. And I'm saying, God, I know I'm not supposed to tell Debbie about this. I know I'm not. But just in case I am, God, it's going to be in here. And it's going to say exactly, da 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 that sentence is not going to say the dee 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 or da 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 God. It's going to say the exact words, da 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 And if it does, then I'll know i got to tell Debbie. Well, guess what? 
About three fourths of the way through that packet, about halfway down that page. Da 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 da. -da. And I said, Oh God, I've got to tell her. I'm going to have to tell her. For me, the day we did step five, it could have been one question. I got to the clubhouse before Debbie. I watched her drive up. I watched her get out of her car. I watched her walk toward me. I watched her walk in front of me into the clubhouse because I knew when we got to that question, my relationship with her was going to change. We walked inside, sat down. We we dove into the question. She would ask the question. I would answer it. We got to that question. She asked it. I answered it. I started crying. I was sitting down, and she came up and stood behind me, and she just wrapped her arms around me and just patted me. And I felt something on top of my head, and it was her tears. And the instant I felt her tears, the shame and the guilt that I felt about what I had done was gone. Now, I still felt responsible. I need to feel responsible for every action and behavior in my life. I need to feel responsible. But the shame and the guilt were just killing me. And it was gone. And my relationship with Debbie did change that day. We were closer than we were before we went into that room. Step six and seven, I did the way I think most people do, or a lot of people do the first time they do them. I, I did each step. I did what I was supposed to do. I read everything. I met with Debbie. We answered 12 questions for each one. I prayed. I was quiet for an hour. I, I did all that stuff. And then I kind of just waited for God to do whatever God was going to do. Well, I've learned over the years that that's just not the kind of God I've got. My God expects me to do my part. He just does. And if I'll do my part, he shows up every single time. But I've got to do my part. There have been three books over the years that have helped me understand my part as step six and seven better than anything else. And those three books are Drop the Rock, Drop the Rock and the Ripple Effect, and Steps and Stories by Sandy Beach. I love those three books. And I live in steps six and seven a good bit today, a good bit today. As I said, Amanda stayed in that, in that hospital for two months. The day she admitted she was alcoholic, they just packed up her stuff and moved her from the side of, the, of that floor that was for people with mental illness to the side of the floor that was for people with alcohol and drug problems. Ain't God good, you know? They just shifted her over there, you know? So when I went to pick her up, I had a contract for her to look at. I wrote the contract myself. And I did it because I come from a long line of martyrs. We know what a martyr is. Woe is me. I can't believe you're doing this to me. How can you do this to me? Well, look at all I'm doing for you. Blah, 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 blah. And I did not want to be that person anymore. So the contract was for me. So that if a man had chose to come stay with me, things would be even Stephen between us so that I couldn't martyr. And I want to mention here, I had also learned, you know, I had taken all that mail home and opened it all up and, talked to some people and went and saw some people, and I had learned that Amanda was facing at least 15 years at Tutwana Prison for Women in Alabama because of the amount of bad checks that she had written. We don't know how much more would have been added on, but just because of the amount, it would have been at least 15 years. So I had chose to pay all that off. So I had paid it all off. So the contract said Amanda had 10 years to pay me back or she would go to Tutwana Prison for Women in Alabama. It also said things like she could stay with me for a while. She had to pay me $100 a month rent. She didn't have a car at the time, so she could use my car sometimes. She had to keep it clean and detailed. I would buy groceries. She had to cook three nights a week. You see, for everything I did, she'd do something. I wouldn't have men spend the night overnight in our home. She wouldn't have men spend the night overnight in our home. So it kept things even steeper. Now, Amanda would tell you if she was here today that she looked at that contract and she thought, hmm, mama or prison? Mama or prison? Well, she picked Mama. She signed the contract. I signed the contract. And we went home to learn how to be a family in recovery. And I'm going to share a couple of quick quick stories about that. Um, she'd been living me, with me a couple of months, and she came home one day. And if any of you know Amanda, she's quite outgoing. She's quite vivacious, you know. She's just always full of life. So she came home and she said, Mama, you know I'm doing everything you want me to do. I've got six part-time jobs. I'm working so hard. I'm going here. I'm going there. i got a sponsor working the steps. I'm doing stuff, Mom. I'm going to all my meetings. I'm cooking. I'm cleaning. But I just don't think I'm going to have the rent money tomorrow. But, Mom, I'm doing everything else you've asked me to do. I'm doing all these things, and I'm doing them so good. And I said, Amanda, you are absolutely right. You have done everything I've asked you to do and more. I hope you are so proud of the woman that you are because it is wonderful what you're doing. And it's okay if you don't have the rent money tomorrow. Because, you see, before you came to stay with me, I went and talked with the Salvation Army here in Dothan. 
And I found out that I can drop you off any time and they'll give you two hots and a cot. So when I get home tomorrow, if the rent money's not on the table, that's okay. I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to be your mother. We'll still do things together. But I'm going to take you to the Salvation Army and drop you off. And you'll never stay with me anymore because you will have broken our contract. And anything you want, you better take because whatever you leave here is going to be mine. Well, you can imagine her eyes were as big as dinner plates, you know. So I went in the bathroom, got in the shower, my favorite place to cry, and I just boo-hooed because I knew I could do that. I knew I could. You see, there were some times in Amanda's life that I would say something to her that I wouldn't say to the checkout clerk at the grocery store. There were some times in her life that I would use a tone of voice that I wouldn't use with the teller at the bank. There were some times in her life I would do gestures or roll my eyes or do stuff or whatever that I wouldn't do with a stranger I'm sitting next to on a plane. And I really believe that day that those days were pretty much done. Because I could finally see my daughter as someone deserving dignity and respect. Deserving dignity and respect. And if any of us in this room had a contract together and one of us broke it, there would be consequences for that. That's just the world we live in. There are consequences for things like that. And Amanda deserved the same dignity and respect that anybody else would have if that happened. I got home the next day. The rent money was on the table, and it was there every month until Amanda moved out. (laughs) Something else that I started learning that year that I continue to learn goes like this. If my name is not in the sentence, it is none of my business. And this is how that works. Sometimes I would say to Debbie, boy, I wonder if Amanda's going to her meetings. And Debbie would say, Angie, your name is not in that sentence. So then I would say, boy, I wonder if Amanda, Angie's daughter, is going to her meetings. (laughs) (laughs) Debbie would say, "Uh uh-uh, you can't do that. Your name is not in that. Here's some other sentences that don't have my name. Is Amanda drinking? Is Amanda working the steps? Does Amanda have a home group? Is Amanda being a good home group member? As the years have gone on, is Amanda being a loving wife? Is Amanda being an awesome mother? Is Amanda being an upstanding citizen? Is Amanda being a woman of dignity and grace and speaking her truth and kindness and love? And on and on and on. My name's in none of that. But here are some sentences that do have my name. Is Angie going to her meetings? Does Angie have a sponsor? Is Angie working the steps? Is Angie being a woman of dignity and grace, speaking her truth and kindness and love? Is Angie being a good wife? Is Angie being an awesome grandmother? Is Angie being a kind mother? On and on and on. I learned that my name was in enough sentences. I really didn't have time left over to worry about those that didn't have my name. Amanda celebrated 32 years in AA this year because of The program that she works, the sponsors that she's had, the God of her understanding. She has a beautiful family. She has a husband named Gary that's just a regular old fella that we absolutely adore. She has two children, Annabelle and Kip. Annabelle is a senior in college, and Kip's fixing to be a freshman. And and they are wonderful, wonderful grandchildren. I'm going to talk about my, my grandson in the workshop in a little bit. They're wonderful grandchildren. And I'm blessed. Amanda still is my daughter, and we're still mother and daughter. I think sometimes there's a a tension that's just bred into those words, you know. But you know what? It's okay because we love each other, and we both work programs of recovery. And we're good, and we have a good, good time with each other, a good time. My mother never did get in recovery. The last couple years of her life, she had COPD and emphysema such that she could no longer drive the car to go buy the alcohol. So she did not drink, but she was not in recovery. And for most of that two-year period of time, she stayed with me in my home for two or three weeks out of the month and with my daughter for about two weeks out of the month because I was out of town some those two weeks for work. And three weekends out of four, I would take her to her home in Andalusia so she could be at her house. I never could have done those things without the rooms of al and without the rooms of Open AA and conventions and roundups and weekends. I couldn't have done that on one hour meeting a week. I could never have done that. But you see, I got immersed in recovery. We would rent a house at the lake, and there'd be 35 or 40 of us, and you wouldn't know who was AA or who was al and we'd all go up there together, and we'd have a 12-step weekend or a promise weekend or some kind of weekend, and I got to watch you. I got to see how people like you in recovery related to each other. 
We had eating meetings. We had all kind of stuff. And we'd go and we'd do and we had fun. And I got to see what it meant to be part of a family, a healthy family, not a family that was on four islands, a family that was all together. I learned that I could love a man and him not expect to have sex with me. I learned that a man could love me and I didn't have to give him sex. I learned that that a dad could care about me and stand up for me and defend me. I learned to love women. When I came to Al-Anon, I didn't much care for women. I just didn't much care for them. But I learned to love women. I learned how to be a good daughter and a loving daughter. From hearing your stories, sometimes Alan's will say to me, well, I don't, I don't go to those AA speaker meetings because that's AA. I can tell you, I've gotten something out of almost every speaker I've heard, whether, whether they've been AA or Alan on. I've heard thousands in 33 years. I've heard a lot of speakers. Oh, man. I heard how, how you helped your mother, how you treated your mother, how your mother's helped you, how you helped your dad. I've learned all kind of stuff about families. And I was able to apply so much of what I had learned with my mother. So much. One day she was sitting on my couch, and out of the blue she said, I know you talk about me when you speak, and at that time I did not talk about it. And I said, no, ma'am, I don't talk about you when I speak. And she said, I know you do. <laughs> and I said, no, ma'am, I don't. And then she said, well, I know you talk about when I used to beat you. And, you know, I thought, ooh, we had never talked about that. I sure wouldn't talk about it in public because we never talked about it in private. And I said, no, ma'am, I don't talk about that. She said, I know you do. And I said, no, ma'am. And then she said what I think was trying to make amends to me. She said, well, you know, I didn't beat you every day. (laughs) You know, she's untreated. I I do believe she was trying to make amends to me. And so I thought, we're here, you know. And so I said, no, ma'am, you didn't beat me every day. But you beat me many days. And one day was one day too many. And then I looked at my mother, and I had what happened to me happened to a speaker I heard talk one time. He said she believed God allowed her to see her her mother the way God saw her mother. And that happened to me that day. You know, my mom had always been 60 feet tall to me. And that day I saw her, this tiny little shriveled up 82-year-old woman sitting on the couch in the middle of the day with her pajamas on, the oxygen tubes in her nose, tethered to this oxygen tank for the rest of her life, scared, sad, alone, afraid, fearful, a woman who had lived her life behind a 10-foot concrete wall that nothing could get in and nothing could get out, a woman who could be whatever she wanted to be. She was a fantastic military officer's wife. She could put a, a buffet meal on or a party or whatever. Fantastic, fantastic. And a woman who beat me. And, you know, I saw the woman that I believe I would have been if it wasn't for her cover. I went over and I knelt down in front of her and I said, and Mom, I said, I want to tell you something. I said, I have forgiven you for that. I have forgiven you for every lick, every hit, every drop of blood, everything. I've forgiven you for that a long time ago. I said, do you remember that day I came to see you and talk to you about things I had done to you and how I had hurt you? She said, yes. I said, I had already forgiven you that day. And that's why I tell this story. You see, when I got to step eight and made my list, Eddie said, we've got some work to do here. She said, now, yes, you have hurt everybody on this list, but most of the people on this list have also hurt you. And Angie, you've got to be able to forgive these people so that when you go see them to make your amends, you've got to be able to go with a heart full of nothing but love so that whatever you do, whatever you say, it is full of love. And whatever they do and whatever they say, it's really not going to matter because you will have done your part. So I had worked on forgiving my mother for a while before I'd ever gone and made those amends. But you see, I didn't tell her that. I just talked about what I had done and how to make that right, and I never told her I had forgiven her for what she did. And it wouldn't it, it would have had to have been that day, but it would have been nice if it had been some day. Well, it was this day, and I told her. And we hugged each other, and we told each other we loved each other, and we cried together. And it was probably the second time in my life that I'd ever seen my mother cry. In 2006, I was doing a 10-step inventory, and I realized that I had turned over every part of my life to God, except the part that had to do with male-female relationships. I was just not willing to give that to God. I don't know why the wreckage is right here now. I can barely walk around and hold my chin up because that's the wreckage of my male-female relationships, you know. But I'm still thinking I can do it better than God. That day I surrendered it. I said, I'm done. 
I can't do this. I've never known how to do this. I can't, I don't believe I'll ever know how. I just can't do it, God. I just can't. So I'm giving it to you. I am giving it to you. And I'm just going to focus on learning how to be a happy, joyous, and free single woman in recovery. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn down dates. I'm going to quit dating. I'm just going to work on that. I'm going to get in therapy. I'm going to start going through this wreckage. I'm going to look at causes and conditions. And then I looked at step 11. I looked at my spiritual life. And this is what I saw. I believed in a God that was a big kahuna in the sky. And I want God to be a big kahuna in the sky. But I also wanted God to be my best friend. I wanted to be able to talk with him just like I'm talking right now. I wanted to be at the grocery store with me, in my car with me, in the bathroom with me, up here with me, and everywhere with me. And he wasn't. He was this big kahuna in the sky. Well, I wanted that, but I also wanted him to be down here with me. So I changed my spiritual life up. I started doing some things different there. So I'm going to therapy. I'm working on spiritual life. I'm not dating anybody. And I went on this journey. And it was an eight-year journey. This young lady came up to me one time. She was probably 22 or 23. I hope so much that I see her again one day. She said, oh, my God, Miss Angie, are you telling me I can't date for eight years? (laughs) (laughs) And I said, no, honey, I'm not telling you that. I don't know how much wreckage you've got. I had a lot of wreckage, a lot of wreckage. But I am telling you this, don't settle. Don't settle. We know when we're settling. We feel that soft voice. We feel that nudge in our gut. We know. I knew when I settled. I settled marriage after marriage. I settled job after job. I settled when I wouldn't move. I settled when I would move. I settled about all kind of stuff in my life. Don't settle. So, eight years later, March the 8th of 2014, I was going to the Flint River Roundup in Albany, Georgia, and I was going to host Bo T. Uh, my, my daughter was going to host his wife, Shirley. They're, they're good, we're good friends of ours. And so I was going through my house and getting everything ready to go. And I'm just talking away to God because you see, now God's my best friend. So I'm just talking away to him and telling him all this stuff and everything, you know. And, and as I'm going out the door, I, I said, God, I just want you to know that I have done everything you wanted me to do. And I'm ready. Well, I shocked myself. I got really teary-eyed, and, and I drove to Flint River, and I was staying with a good friend of mine named Jean. Jean still remembers that day. She remembers that day. She remembers when I walked in the hotel room that day because she knew something was different. I walked in, and she said, Angie, what has happened? So I told her. And I said, Jean, I just talked to God. And, oh, yeah, yeah. and I said, then I just told God, God, I want you to know I've done everything you wanted me to do, and I'm ready. And then I said, because that's the kind of God I've got today, let's see how long it takes God. Well, Chip and I have a picture that's on our refrigerator. Less than 24 hours later, my daughter Amanda made our picture on the stage there at the Flint River Roundup in Albany, Georgia. And a 14-year friendship started to change. Now, I had told God, God, if you ever see fit to put another man in my life, you're going to have to hold him there and keep him there because I'm not going to be looking. And I reckon 14 years was long enough. Because things started to change, and six months later we were married, and I have celebrated my first ever second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth wedding anniversaries. <laughs> and marriage is pretty good. Marriage is pretty good. When we got married, Chip had 26 years, and I had 24 years. He had 26 in AA, I had 24 in Al-Anon. My sponsor said, well, this marriage is starting off of 50 years. Maybe it's got a chance. Uh, I adore Chip. I adore Chip. The last few years have been pretty rough. He's had some some health issues that are that are going to keep being health issues. Uh, but we're dealing with it and we're living life and we're having a good time. We're having a good time. So that brings me to step twelve. I have had a spiritual awakening, not because I go to meetings, not because I speak once in a while, not because I set up the chairs at my home group. Those things are good and they're part of my program. But I've had a spiritual awakening because I've worked the steps with a sponsor who has worked the steps. Now, what do I do with the spiritual awakening that I have? I find in my life, I don't have to worry about being so spiritually fit and practicing this principle in all my affairs in a meeting, unless it's a business meeting. I usually don't have a problem. It's the other 23 hours of the day when I'm out there in the world that cause problems for me most of the time. So how do I live this program? I'm going to share two or three stories about that, and then I'll be done. 
probably five or six years ago now, I realized that I was saying things on social media that a woman of dignity and grace did not need to be saying. I was getting in arguments with people. I was being egotistical with people. I was being like, my dog's better than your dog, except we weren't talking about dogs, if you know what I mean. Uh, I was arguing. Man, I was bad. I was really bad. My sponsor is not on social media, so she didn't know. <laughs> but I have sponsees that are on social media, and they did know. None of them said anything, but they knew. Finally, I called Mary Beth, who's my sponsor today, has been my sponsor for a number of years now. I called her, and I said, Mary Beth, I got a confession to make, and I told her what I'd been doing. She said, oh, my God, Angie. I said, I know. Tell me about it. She said, woo, we've got some work to do here. She said, we've got to look at causes and conditions. we got to look at what got you here, and we got to look at what we're going to do about it. Well, what we were going to do about it was pretty easy. I had to go on social media world and make amends, and I did. I went on social media world, and I said, basically, my name is Angie Baldwin, and I'm here today to tell you that I have been doing things and saying things on social media that a woman of dignity and grace does not need to be doing or saying. Here is all of my contact information. If I have offended, harmed, done anything to you that's caused you to feel bad in any way, please contact me, and I'm going to do everything in my power to make it right. And I make a pledge here today that I'm going to do everything in my power to never, ever, ever do those things again. And I've done my best to never, ever, ever do those things again. Because that wasn't real fun. Then we had to look at, how did I get there? And I realized that I was living again in a place of fear. You know, I had I had lived most of my life in fear about something. I had made decisions based on fear. I'd married people based on fear, divorced based on fear, moved based on fear, taken jobs based on fear, left jobs based law, everything based on fear. But when I got in recovery, the fear wouldn't wane. I didn't work on fear. As I worked the 12 steps, I just realized one day the fear was gone. And it stayed gone until then. And I was back in the midst of the fear. And I have learned from me, whenever I'm in fear, under that fear, it's always a lack of faith and trust in God. So I had to up my spiritual game, do some stuff different with my spiritual life, and when I did, the fear went away, and I know if I will stay spiritually fit, that fear is never going to come back again. Never. A couple of years ago, I was watching, so that's practicing these principles in all my affairs, isn't it? Yeah. A couple of years ago, I was watching the news one night. This will tell you how egotistical I am and how self-centered I am. And in the middle of that newscast, I said, you know, now the newscaster's talking about all these people doing all these things to all these other people and people saying stuff and doing stuff and stuff happening. And in the middle of that newscast, I sat up and I said out loud, oh, my God, how can you love every one of those people just as much as you love me? How can you do that, God? That's my God. How can you love all those people as much as you love me? How dare you do that? And I went on a rant at God. I was so angry at God. I was mad at God for weeks. I was so angry. I was so angry. I could not understand how he could do that. Oh, man. I talked to my sponsor. We inventoried it. I prayed about it. I did all this kind of stuff. It didn't help. I was just angry, angry, angry at God. Finally, I got to a place where I knew I had a decision to make, and this was the decision I had to make. Was I going to believe in a great, big, all-encompassing God of love? Or was I going to believe in a little God that looked like me and walked like me and talked like me and voted like me and believed like me and everything like me? Which was I going to pick? Well, I waited a few more weeks and stayed mad because I knew what I was going to pick and I knew what that was going to mean, so I just stayed mad a little longer. (laughs) And then finally I said, I want that all-encompassing God alive. And for me, what that means is that God expects me To love every one of the people on that newscast. Just as much as I believe God loves me. And so that's the journey I've been on. I believe it's a journey I'll be on the rest of my life. Sometimes it means finding one grain of sand in common with somebody. And if you live on the beach like I do, you know, trying to find one particular grain of sand is a pretty tall order. But I believe I am charged with that. I believe I was charged with that the day I got in recovery. 
Because today when I buy a Starbucks in Destin, Florida, or when I get back home and I buy a Starbucks in Destin, Florida, and the lady usually waits on me, shows up at my meeting on Tuesday, what is she going to think about Al-Anon when she sees me? What's she going to think about al When I go to the grocery store and I go through the line I usually go through and I'm talking to the checkout people and I'm calling them by name, <clears throat> what are, what's one of them going to think when they come to my al meeting about al I believe I'm, you know, I, I read about we're a program of attraction, not promotion, and I wonder what does, it, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a program of attraction? I believe I am the program of attraction. It's not the room, because most people don't ever get to the room. It's not the literature, because most people never read the literature. What's left? It's us. We are the program of attraction. When people see me out, do they think, man, I want what she's got, or do they think, boy, she's a pissy woman? <laughs> I'm glad I'm not married to her. I'm glad she's not my mom. I'm glad. You know, what do they think when they see me out? You know, I am the program of attraction. My last story. 2014, Chip and I were at the Gulf Coast, Gulf Breeze Jubilee in Gulf Shores, Alabama. And we were standing in the food line waiting to get our food. And it was Chip and me and a young man named John. And John was, I think, 38 at the time. And he had been in AA four years. And John was and is a dear friend of, of my daughter. I should say our daughter because Amanda claims Chip too. She says he's her bonus daddy. John is a, was, is a dear friend of, of our daughter Amanda. So we're talking, John and I are. And I asked him, how's going? And we're talking. He says, Angie, I'm really struggling. And he got really serious. And I said, well, John, what's going on? He said, well, I'm, I'm trying to work set nine. And he said, you know, my parents, they passed on. John's, John's dad died when he was nine, and his mother died when he was 28. And he said, I can't make amends to him because they passed on. And I'm just struggling. And he got really serious and teary out about it. And, you know, there's usually something I say to people when they tell me they want to make amends to somebody that's passed on. But I felt that little nudge that day. I felt that little nudge. So that's not what I said. What I said was, well, John, we're standing right here. And he looked at Chip and he looked at me. And he said, oh, my God, would you be my parents? And Chip and I looked at each other and we looked at John and we said, absolutely. So since that day in 2014, Chip and I have been John's parents, his parents of the heart, and and we have a son. I always wanted a son and never got to have a son. Well, I've got a son, and I've had a son since 2014. And this is what that looks like. We talk to John. John talks to us. We do things together. John wanted to get a job at the beach. He got a fabulous job at the beach. He came and lived with us for about six months till he could get a place to live. So John lived with us, and we were a family. And he'd come home every night, and I'd have dinner ready for us when he got home, just like my mama did. And we'd all sit around the table and talk. And one night John said, you know, I can't remember the last time I came home to family. And I said, well, John, I can't remember the last time family came home because Amanda's been gone for a long time, and they come visit, but she hadn't stayed with us, you know. And then one day we were sitting there talking, and John said, you know, Angie, he said, my parents loved me so good, but they didn't know all of who I am. And he said, you and Chip know all of who I am, and you love me so good. And I knew in that instant why I didn't give that standard reply that day in that food line. Why I said to John, we're your parents. John had to have hip surgery, and he came to stay with us, and he's getting his other hip done uh, August the 2nd. And I'm going to drive him to the hospital and be there, and he's coming to our house to recuperate. And <clears throat> It's wonderful. It is wonderful. Amanda loves John. We have holidays and stuff. We all get together. We're all there. We all have the family pictures together. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful. And it never would have happened without recovery, ever. Well, we've been here this weekend. Things have opened back up now, so there are people that are meeting like this all over the world, and they're doing what we're doing. They're sharing the language of the heart with each other. I thank you for letting me share my language of the heart with you. I'm Angie a grateful member of al Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.